Now we'll be starting with Spinoza from the Rationalists. Uh, unlike Descartes' notion of clearness and distinctness, Spinoza begins his philosophy with the unity of all things. He laid down the most uncompromising monism in the West, which is essentially similar to Vedant philosophy in India. He believes that an object apart from its connection with any other thing is an abstraction and unreal. Therefore, the object is real only if it follows from whole reality. From this notion, Spinoza derived his concept of substance. Now, Spinoza defines substance as follows. By substance, I understand that which is in itself and is conceived through itself, that is, the conception of another thing from which it must be formed. From metaphysics, metaphysical and epistemological point of view, substance is not dependent on anything else. Neither existence nor knowledge of substance depend on anything exterior to it. Substance is one, infinite, eternal, perfect, self-caused and cause of everything involved. If more than one substance is accepted, none of them can be accepted as infinite and unique as one substance will act as a kind of limitation on the other. On this ground, Spinoza rejects Descartes' notion of dependent substances as the substance cannot be dependent on anything. Spinoza calls substance as a god, which he defines as something which is infinite, eternal and unlimited. The elaboration and implications of the concept of substance. Every determination is negation. Ordinarily, we can conceive or understand a thing by comparing it with other things. For example, when we say board is white, we understand the shape and color of it by comparing it with similar objects. The insistence on uniqueness and infiniteness of the substance makes it incomparable with other things. Thus, we cannot comprehend substance by understanding finite things. Moreover, since substance is infinite thing, it cannot lack anything. If we try to define substance in subject, predicate form like finite things, the way S is P, it will result in logical contradiction because when we qualify S with P, it automatically makes S devoid of not P. It will be a limitation on the substance since it becomes devoid of something. Thus, any attempt to determine substance like the ordinary thing will limit its infinite nature. This culminates in Spinoza's dictum about substance that every determination is negation. As implication of every of the above dictum, there is no scope for equating the god of religion with substance in Spinoza's philosophy. The god of religion is having all personalistic attributes like love and kindness. If we say god is kind, then it cannot be cruel. In the other word, if we ascribe an attribute on god, it automatically makes it devoid of something. Like the Parabrahma of Sankaracharya, Spinoza's <coughs> god is impersonalistic god, which is not an object of devotion. The God is causa sui or self-caused. Since substance is the most supreme being, it cannot be caused by anything else. Thus, God is causa sui or cause self-caused. This causation should not be considered in the temporal sense as a connection between two events. Just like three sides of a triangle can be deduced from its very concept, we can deduce the infinite, eternal, unlimited substance cannot be caused by anything other than itself. Take care. Rejection of personalistic creator God, that is Spinoza as hideous atheist. In Christian theology, the world is created as creation of the God. Spinoza's notion of substance can never accommodate a creator god due to the following reasons. Creation implicates will, intellect and feeling, which are all the traits of personalistic god which is different from the concept of substance in Spinoza. If god created world created world out of something else, then that entity will become co-eternal with god. Spinoza being a strict monist can never accept anything other than god. He equates world with god. Now concept of creator god presupposes the reality of temporal order. Since there would be a time when there was no world, since substance is eternal, always existence and beyond temporality of the idea of creation contradicts the same. Now, no scope for free will. The concept of free will in individuals is not compatible with substance as everything in substance and human as a human being cannot change the nature of substance. Moreover, Spinoza is treated as an atheist by traditional theologist, theologian as he accepts pantheism which treats human, world and God as one. Thus, according to Spinoza, the substance of God is the self-creating reality as well as the sum total of all that that exists. Substance is eternal, infinite and beyond description. In order to explain the physical world and human experiences, Spinoza introduces the concept of attributes and modes. Now, attributes, Spinoza defines attribute as as follows. By, by attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives as constituting the essence of a substance. On one hand, Spinoza says that any attempt to determine the substance by ascribing qualities on it will negate a number of other qualities which will finally limit the infinite substance. On the other hand, he introduces the concept of attribute which appears as a self-contradictory position. Spinoza's conception of attributes has been understood differently by different philosophers so as to make it consistent with Spinoza's notion of substance. Idealists like Hegel emphasize on the subjective part that is, human intellect perceives and say that attributes don't really belong to God and it is the human intellect which perceives it as belonging to God. Hence, we can reconcile every determination is negation with the definition of attributes. This explanation has some parallels with Sankaracharya who does not treat Maya as an essential attribute of Brahman. But Spinoza, who was brought up in a scholastic logical traditions, is less likely to endorse this interpretation. From Spinoza's own writing, one can say he endorses the view that attributes really belong to the substance. This is known as realistic or attributist view of substance. If we believe that substance has infinite attributes which can exist without limiting each other, the concept of attribute can be reconciled with the concept of substance. According to Spinoza, thought and extension are attributes of substance. These two attributes are boundless and can exist in limit without limiting each other and there is no contradiction in claiming that substance has attributes. Moreover, it can also be said that substance has infinite attributes out of which human beings can perceive only thought and extension. Even these two attributes cannot be known in their entirety by limited human intellect. 
From the realistic position, it can be concluded that substance has infinite number of boundless attributes which exist parallelly without limiting each other. Of these boundless attributes, human intellect can perceive two of them, thought and extension, in a limited sense, not, not in its totality. Now for modes, Spinoza says, if eternal, unchangeable substance is the only reality, then what are those finite, changing and perishable things which we come across in this world? In order to account for this question, Spinoza introduces the notion of modes. Spinoza says, by mode I understand the affection of a substance or that which is in another through which it is also conceived. By definition, modes for their existence and for being knowable are dependent on something else. For example, motion and rests are the modes of extension. Intellect and will are modes of thought. They are to the substance what the waves are to the sea. They can never exist without substance, though substance exists without them. Here we have to understand the difference between infinite mode and finite modes. The finite modes are individual things of finite experience. For instance, will and intellect of a particular human being or movement of a particular object are finite modes. Movement is a universal phenomena which cannot be conceived without the concept of substance. Similarly, intellect and will also associated with any knowledge where there some thoughts are involved, hence movement, will and intellect can be conceived as infinite modes of substance. To be specific, movement is understood as infinite mode of extension, which in turn is in an which in turn is an infinite, boundless attribute of substance. Will and intellect can be understood as infinite mode of thought, another fi infinite, boundless attribute of substance. Thus, finite things which are in motion as well as finite will and intellect of human being constitute the infinite modes of substance. By distinguishing between infinite and finite modes, Spinoza aims to say that motion, the infinite mode is internal, eternal, but the finite things which originate and decay are perishable. While will and intellect are eternal in finite modes, will and intellect of a particular human being are transient. Spinoza sometimes regards modes as real affections, actually existing in gods and sometimes as mere illusions. He compares substance with ocean and modes with perishable waves. These conflicting views can be reconciled only when we don't compromise with the view that substance is indeterminate and the relation between substance, attributes and modes are inexplicably in the logical sense as we see in Advaitic traditions. Parallelism and mind-body problem Now Spinoza has accepted thought and extension as parallel attributes of the same substance. These two are inseparable aspects of the same thing like the convex and concave of the same lens. From one point of view, God appears as infinite extension and from the other as uh, and from the other as the finite infinite thought. One aspect cannot exist without the other. Then we understand the circle in terms of its circumference. Its area is also associated with it and vice versa. Now mind and body are finite modes of the substance. The structure in which mind and body operate is the same. There is no causal relation between mind and body. That is no interaction. Human is a finite version of God for he is a mode of God's attribute of thought and extension. As an outcome of his pantheistic notion of substance, Spinoza denies the possibility of independent existence and independent activity for mind and body. Being coexistent, attributes of substance, both of them cannot interact. Therefore, Descartes' interactionism, which is based on causal interaction between two substances, that is mind and body, is totally rejected by Spinoza. Also, the occasionalist view of divine intervention in accounting for mind-body problem is also accepted by Spinoza, as his substance is not the god of religion. <coughs> Here one can see that Spinoza's parallelism is not a solution for mind-body problem, but a deduction from his notion of substance with strong deterministic underpinnings, which evades a solution to the problem. Does Spinoza successfully reconcile substance with attributes? Though Spinoza say attributes can exist parallelly without limiting each other, he believes that intellect, which is a mode of infinite thought, can, ex can know extension by overstepping its boundaries. But the reverse is impossible. It, tantamount, it is tantamount to limiting the attributes of extension in comparison with the attributes of thought. If thoughts can overstep its boundaries, why can't it know other attributes of substance other than that of extension and thought? Hmm. Spinoza is not giving any logical reasoning for why should inde indeterminate substance have attributes at all. Once he accepts attributes, they should be organically connected to substance. The concept of parallelism is nothing but simply naming the attributes without organically linking them with the substance. Spinoza's notion of every determination is negation and his view for rejecting a personalistic god are based on grounds that opposing attributes cannot coexist in a substance. When he claims that opposing attributes like thoughts and extension can coexist parallelly, it is self-contradicting his thoughts. When Spinoza qualifies the attributes with the word infinite, it becomes an indeterminate as before, we can conceive only finite things. Also, the notion of finite attributes is inaccessible to human thoughts. In the entire analysis about attributes, one can see an idealistic tendency in Spinoza's philosophy. That is, he gives primacy to thought over other attributes. If this thought can be equated to pure consciousness of Advait Vedant and attributes of Maya, attributes to Maya, the inexplicable power of the ultimate, the notion of attributes, will get reconciled with substance in the way as interpreted by Hegel. In Indian philosophy as well, one can see Ramanujan Acharya failing to account for relation between Brahman and its real attributes. Now, freedom and determinism in Spinoza. All the aspects of Spinoza's philosophy have to be analyzed in light of concept of the most supreme being, the substance. As discussed earlier, human thoughts and wills are nothing but finite perishable modes of substance. Hence, they are not real. The substance is self-caused and self-determined by its logical nature. Hence, the idea of free will, which presupposes the possibility of voluntary human action, is incompatible with the notion of substance. Humans cannot change order of events in nature since it necessarily follows from God. 
This necessarily implicates determinism, which rules out freedom of human control over own actions. However, Spinoza conceives freedom in different sense. An activity is said to be free when it follows from the very nature of our being. Man is said to be free when he acts in consonance with his true nature, which is governed by reason. We are, when we act under the sway of passions and emotions, we are not making use of reason to have a clear picture of nature of the things. When we start understanding about things through reason, the passions will disappear and we understand about the true nature of our sorrows and pleasures. Spinoza says that a wise human will never hate, nor envy, nor be angry with other beings. Thus, the concept of morality, which presupposes the idea of free will, is made compatible with Spinoza's philosophy by stating that a human being acting under reason will be inherently moral. The supreme state of freedom, which is the highest state of knowledge, is called Amor Intellectualis Teis, or Intellectual Love of God by Spinoza. These thoughts have strong parallels with liberation through Gyan Mark in Indian philosophy. However, if we analyze from an ex existentialist perspective who believe in the dictum of existence precedes ex essence, Spinoza's conception of freedom is nothing but pure determinism. Here, Spinoza accepts substance as the only reality, ignores the concrete individual. It cannot be said that the essence of a human being is reason. It is up to the individual to create his or her own essence, making use of available possibilities, over which one has got complete freedom to act. That'll be it for Spinoza. We'll be starting with Lebanese in the next video.